Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin. Today I'm doing a little hook and line from shore for rockfish, baby. Let's go. started today, um, in case you missed the last video, I've started a foraging guide service. So I'm teaching people, mostly in the Bay Area here, um, how to fish, how to forage for shellfish, for sea urchin, etc. If we get those rains, uh, I'll take people out for wild edible mushrooms, wild edible greens. I also teach people free dive spearfishing, uh, free diving for giant red urchin as well as a suite of survival skills, friction fire, stone tool making, shelter building, etc. November has some awesome low tides right at the beginning of the month and then again about midway through the month. December is the same. These are filling up super quickly so if you want in on these let me know. Send me an email catchandcookca at gmail.com. Some people have contacted me and want to book uh, individual outings. They want to go free dive spearfishing just one-on-one. -on -one. Totally cool with that. Um, I offer a slightly reduced rate if you go with two to four people. So it's always easier if you can organize that yourself, just get a friend group together. But I understand that not everybody has a friend circle that's really interested in coastal foraging, survival skills, etc. So I'm going to offer some of these classes, I guess I could call them, or outings, forays, etc. Um, we're going to do one called Muscles in the Moonlight, and we're going to do another one called the clam connection. So, the way this works is you are only you are only legally allowed to harvest clams until 30 minutes after sunset. Which means you can't even be on the beach with clam digging equipment after 30 minutes after sunset. So there are tons of good low tides in November and December as I said, but the problem is with the winter low tides, which is the safest time to harvest shellfish like clams, mussels, etc. Um, those low tides are always in the afternoon and evening, and a lot of them are after sunset. So mussels in the moonlight, that'll be sort of a meet and greet kind of situation. A bunch of people from different walks of life will all come together. We will social distance. I'm totally vaccinated. I hope you are as well. We will forage after dark by headlamp in some pretty safe intertidal environments. I don't want to take people out for their first foray at night and go for, you know, go for eels or something like that where people are going to be very likely to slip and fall and things like that. We're going to go to straight to the mussels, forage some mussels. It'll be a two hour event and the last half hour I'm going to cook up a little one pot delicious dish so everybody gets a little appetizer, again socially distanced and uh, that'll be quite nice. I think it's one of those things that if you've never been foraging before, it's a great way to kind of cut your first experience. And then the dam connection. So that one is going to be some of these low tides that go right up to sunset and then beyond sunset. And what we'll do is we'll clam up until about 20 minutes after sunset. And we'll move locations and we'll go for mussels after that. So you'll really be going for clams and mussels. These events are coming up quickly. They're going to fill up quickly. If you want more information on this, send me an email. I'll get this on the books. Let's get going. That being said, here is your adventure from a few weeks ago doing a little hook and line on the beach, catch and cook. Alrighty folks, I'm out here. I'm going to do a little shore casting. I'm in a rocky area. You can hear that swell. It's not exactly mellow, but it's mellow enough. There's some pretty heavy wind off the point, so I'm kind of back in a little bit trying to keep a little sheltered. That way there's less wind mixing up the sediments, hopefully a little bit better visibility. But today I'm largely going to be relying on the scent of the bait. I'm using a Shimano 4000 reel, Zebco Special Select. This whole setup probably costs like 50 bucks. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, so guys, I just hit the water and bam, there's a fish immediately. It feels like a good one. Let's see what we got. Oh man. Oh yeah, it's a nice rock fish. Oh. Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, baby. Sorry about that angle. That was like the moment it hit the water. I didn't even have a chance to get the, uh, the camera going. That is a beautiful grass rockfish. <sighs> Trying to keep the sun off. Thanks again, Matt. Appreciate the uh, neck gator. I gotta dispatch it and then we'll, uh, we'll do a little catch and cook. Watching the water. Not too bad. What I realized when I got out here is I forgot my leader. I don't have any mono other than the little leaders that come on those pre-tied octopus hooks. So I'm gonna daisy chain two of those pre-tied leaders. And because it looks like the swell is just building, all I'm gonna do is, is put my weight right at the end of my braid and I'm gonna run a leader right off that weight, daisy chain together, <laughs> and I'm gonna put a big hunk of squid, maybe two hunks on there. My thought is, big bait catches big fish. Too much for a perch to hit, so I hope it's gonna entice a rockfish, or a cabazon, or maybe a link. I can see some rocks out in here. They're really dark. Let me show you what I mean. So it's probably hard to tell, but yeah, there's a lot of like dark shapes you can see under the water that tells you that there's structure, that there's reef. So I'm gonna cast in between a few of those that kind of make a little bowl or like a corral. And I'm hoping in the middle of that, the swell is not moving so much and the fish might be congregating. That was the moment that that hit the water. Another good sized grassy. It's a little smaller, but I'm gonna keep this one as well. I think I'm gonna call it. I still cannot believe this worked. All right, so check it out. You guys are gonna think I'm crazy, that's okay. I got here and I had that guy. So I just tied him on real quick. I had no mono, so I daisy chained two of these pre-made leaders that come with these octopus hooks right on the weight there. And then I put a ton of squid. I am a firm believer that big bait catches big fish. When I'm out on a boat, I'll just drop a little bit of bait. It's no big deal. But when I'm on shore, I feel like everybody's throwing these little bits. It's almost like ringing your buddy's doorbell and being like, hey, I brought you a walnut. You wanna come downstairs and get it? Your buddy's like, no, I'm just gonna keep watching the Mandalorian. If you ring the doorbell, and you're like, hey, I just shelled a pound of wild walnuts. Would you like to come down and grab them? Your buddy's gonna be like, dude, that's really nice. Sure, I'll come down. There's your pound of wild walnuts with no effort, no processing required. Before we get to cooking, let's take a little trip over to the Central Valley. Except I don't really wanna drive over there, but I need to get over there to get some ingredients. So let's try this instead. Wow, man. That was way faster than driving all the way out here. I should try that snap trick a little more often. It's really hot. It's like 110, so I'm in the shade. Uh, but this right back here, this is the gray pine. This is what we're here for. It grows from about 500 feet in elevation to a, a little over 3,000 feet, in between the three and 4,000 feet range. It's one of the first pines you're gonna see as you're going through the Sierra foothills into the mountains. Um, you'll see it here in California, both on the western slopes of the Sierra foothills and the eastern slopes of the coast range, the needles. If you break off one of these guys, they come in groups of three. The resin or sap on them makes excellent glue. It's also incredibly flammable, which means be super careful. The ground around here is just covered with pine needles. This is crazy flammable, which is great if you're having a fire in a discreet area. You need to get it going. This stuff works excellent, especially with a little pine pitch. 
but don't have your fire underneath one of these trees or that fire will get out of hand in a moment. But the reason that we're here right now, this is midsummer, we're here for the pine cones because those pine cones are huge and inside those cones are delicious pine nuts. Now these are what we're looking for. But these particular ones are probably from last year or even the year before. You note that very gray color. So that's what the cone looks like, but we want to find it in like a golden brown color. So it was this year's that just dropped so that that way we can for sure get some pine nuts. This one's actually really on the small size. They usually get about two, three times as big, but that's the color you're looking for, that nice golden. You gotta be really careful because each one of these scales is equipped with a claw that can totally dig into you. And a lot of times they're covered with uh, pine pitch. You can see a little bit of it right here. But underneath these scales, right down in there, tucked in there, look, I've got resin on my finger. Tucked down in there are pine nuts. I'm gonna show you here when we get back. Because it's too hot. I'm gonna harvest some of these. I don't know if you can see, I'm just sweating. Sweating bullets. It's too hot. I'm gonna harvest some of these. And uh, yeah, let's go back to the coast. Ho, 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 back at the coast, in the woods. I like the snap trick, that's uh, snappy. We're gonna do a little Italian breadcrumb and pine nut encrusted rockfish, fried till golden brown with a little uh, Greek salad, Mediterranean style. First things first, got this uh, sandstone slab, pretty cool. I don't know, there's these little flies, these little deer flies. I don't know if you guys have ever messed with those. Usually they're in the valley, they're not out here, but apparently, locally, they've hatched. They're a little annoying. We'll be okay. <laughs> I'm gonna take this gray pine cone here and just knock them loose. I don't know if you can see this. There's a gray pine nut right there on this rock, and that's gonna knock loose a whole bunch of pine nuts. I lost my tripod. I don't know what to do about it. Get another one, I guess. But in the meantime, I'm gonna try and make do. <laughs> That's awesome. I wish I could film. What is holding you guys in place right now is a split stick sticking out of the ground. No tripod necessary. You can see that? I hit it, so I orient it so it's up and down, not to the side. And then, theoretically, boom. We open it up. That's a pine nut. Take that out. That right there, we can then roll on the rock a little bit and that gets rid of that sheath. So that's what we got so far. And there's a bunch that have fallen down in here that I'm gonna pick up as well. All right. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna do a few at a time. I'm just gonna gently crush them. Both of these are water-worn. Um, stones so they've been cleaned again and again and again in the surf i washed them again but there's no real sand on here they're not sloughing off any material so it should work similar to a uh, mano and matate which is a common grinding implement used in mexico mesoamerica south america um, but i'm not actually going to be grinding these i'm just going to use it to kind of like roll and crush these pine nuts a little bit oh yeah it's working beautifully You can actually see the oil from the nuts like secreting as you're crushing it. These are totally jam-packed full of all kinds of heart-healthy oils. Oh, it smells really good too. That's awesome. See that staining on there? That's all from the oil from the pine nut. So in the archaeological record we actually find uh, implements like this and I have friends and colleagues who actually study under magnification, they'll study the lipids, they'll study phytoliths, all these kinds of um, traces of plant foods that have been processed on what we refer to as milling implements like these. And so we can actually find these types of items that you can't really date um, unless you have them uh, in a layer that's associated with something like uh, perhaps a carbonized 
pine nut shell here that we could actually radiocarbon date. Then we can get an associated date. But I think it's really interesting that if you can uh, analyze the phytoliths or trace residues and things like that that are on these milling implements, you can actually get at human behavior, understanding the types of um, foods that were being processed on these particular artifacts. Because let's face it, pretty much the rock and maybe a couple of carbonized fragments of these shells would be all that might preserve in the archaeological record. Let's get some fish rolling in this. A labor of love. It's not much, but we don't need much. I think it's going to have a whole lot of flavor in it. Here's where the old meets the new. We got some tomatoes, which uh, you know I didn't even think about till this moment, but uh, pine nuts. That's ancient California Native American cuisine. The tomato, the rest of the world can also thank Native Americans for because this is also OG Native American cuisine. That's where it was developed. So we're gonna cut up some cherry tomatoes. Just have them, nothing crazy, keeping it simple. And then I have some Greek feta cheese. I have some Greek olive oil. I've already got some red onion in there. I've got some cucumber in there. And to my right here, I have a jar of Greek Kalamata olives. We are doing Greek salad. One for the chef. Mm. Mm. I love those olives. Oh man, it needs more. So good. Now this Greek salad is crazy simple. Got some Greek feta. Just crumble some of that on there. It's all and then do not forget need some fresh oregano. Pull this off the stem. Chop it up a little. Oh, it smells so good. Nothing like fresh herbs, huh? Dressing is ridiculously simple. I'm gonna use a little red wine vinegar. You could use white vinegar as well. And then a little bit of fresh extra virgin olive oil. Got my spice kit that my brother made me, a little bit of salt. Don't need too much because there is salt in that uh, feta cheese. And a little fresh ground black pepper. And that right there smells absolutely amazing. Now let's get some fish frying. Stove is on. You'll notice I'm in a pine grove. This is like pretty much a tinder box. I don't recommend that people do this. I've got water right here, a whole bunch of it. I got a shovel right here. I'm not moving an inch from where I am. I'm just gonna sit here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cook, take this off and move it. I'm gonna turn the stove off and move it. I'm gonna check the ground here. If there's anything that doesn't look like it should, I'm dumping water all over everything here. I'm gonna take some of the rockfish that I caught earlier and I'm gonna dredge it in those Italian breadcrumbs and pine nuts. Just get it nice and stuck in there like that. Into the oil it goes. I don't damn. Alright y'all, oh, wish you had smell vision Boom! Look at that platter. Beautiful Greek salad, pine nut encrusted, and Italian breadcrumb fried rockfish. Alright, here we go. Uh, yeah, I'm not 
even using a fork. Fish first. Mmm. 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 Dude. Mmm. Hang on. A little bit of finishing salt. Get one of these pieces of fish with a bunch of stuff on it. The pine nut is a bit more subtle than I thought it was going to be. Maybe I didn't have quite enough, but it's there. It's just grab a little bit. Hmm. It's almost like cooking took some of the um, the potency out of it, but it's buttery. That's good. That's really good. And the rockfish has exceptional texture. Man, I love rockfish. All right, now I'm a firm believer when you do Greek salad, you gotta try and get every bite to have a little bit of everything. So there it is. Tomato, red onion, Kalamata olive, feta, a little bit of oregano, and some cucumber. Mm. Mm. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I make the heck out of a salad. <laughs> there are people who think that a salad is a side dish. Um, I think every salad you make should be able to stand alone on its own. And this one definitely does. <laughs> this is like a feast fit for kings. <laughs> I can't remember the name of this chef. I think it's Aki's something. I'm gonna link his channel because I kind of winged mine based on what he does for his Greek salad, but he's one of my favorite chefs. He does all kinds of amazing Greek meals and, and also meals that are, you know, desserts and everything that's not necessarily Greek, but he's a fantastic chef. He's been on Jamie Oliver and all these folks. Check him out if you're looking to do some uh, Greek food especially, but just check him out in general. He's got really good uh, cooking skills. Anyway, um, Oh, now we're going for everything, huh? That oregano totally, totally adds. It's so good. Mmm. This is a winner. <laughs> this is really, really good. All right. Um, I'm not going to make you watch me eat this entire thing, but guaranteed I'm sitting here and eating all this. Part of the Clean Plate Club. Uh, the guide stuff, an update. Um, my first client that came with me ended up going home with two massive eels and 10 legal rock crab. Uh, Dungeness season is coming up in the next two, three weeks. And uh, I don't know, it's on. If you want to go, there's a lot of really solid low tides, but I'm not kidding. They're booking up super quickly. So let me know. Uh, you can email me in the meantime. Catch the letter N, cook, C-A, at Gmail. All right. Till next time, keep the old ways alive. Here's your outtakes. <laughs> the needles. So, if you pull one of these out of here, they come in twos. No, they don't. They usually come in threes. What's really interesting to me is whether you have the date or not, if you can analyze phytolytics. I kid you not. Okay, so over here, the camera was stuck in a split stick. Now it's sitting on top of a pine cone. I wish I had another camera so I could take pictures of all this. It's awesome.